Hello, science alliance. Oh, brilliant. There's loads of people here. Wow, is this because I like advertised it? Is this because I told, I did this weird new thing where I actually told people that this lesson was going to happen and now more people have come? Hmm. I need to think about that <laughs> as a future business idea. Right, I'm going to go and get a square piece of paper, a piece of paper. Oh, I've got one here. All right, fine. I just want to go upstairs because I've got a new cardi, okay? And I want to wear it. I want to show you my cardi. So sorry. I'm going to be another 60 seconds because I'm getting my cardi again. And then we're going to get started. probably know but if you are on Facebook if you're not well done but if you are then you can go to my Facebook page and uh, there's, a, there's always a post there when I'm live on YouTube saying if you want to say hello and ask any questions you can do it here so it's, it's, a, it's good for some people most people like it but for some people it's a bit frustrating that you can't tell me what you're working on Ooh. There. so if you want to show me your ideas uh, and send me any photos of what you've done, you can put them in that post. Just say hello. There we go. Yeah. Ow! And that's it, that's all we need. Okay, Woo. Sorry, that's finding a hair bubble. Okay, I'm gonna flip you around. You see, more people have arrived since I started faffing. Faffing always pays off. Okay, flipping you around. Hello, everyone. Hello, it is me, Lara, wearing my new cardigan from Theatre of Science. This is uh, lesson three on ecosystems, but you don't have to have been to the other lessons to enjoy this lesson. We've got three more lessons, I think, on ecosystems coming up. And then after the Easter holidays, I think we're going to do waves because I'm a physics teacher and I like waves. OK, but last week, very quickly, uh, what we did was we looked at food chains. We looked at basically pictures of living things in a row. So here we've got a leaf, a creepy worm, a robin and a bird of prey. And like, I think a lot of us were quite surprised by the direction that the arrows go in a food chain. So you draw an arrow when you're drawing a food chain from the robin to the bird of prey, from the worm to the robin. It doesn't feel right because it's like, but you want to say robin eats worm, worm eats leaf. And we did touch last week on the fact that it's the arrow shows you which way the energy is flowing. But we didn't talk about that at all. So today we get to talk about that. What does that mean? Energy is flowing from the leaf to the worm, from the worm to the what? Okay, so first of all, I'm not sure my new card is working, you know. It feels, it feels a bit busy. Now I'm going to take it off. Uh, we need to talk about what is energy. So have you got some sort of hair bubble or elastic band with you? Um, <clears throat> if you have, grab it now. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> but if you've got an elastic band, then... Um, we're going to have a little fiddle with it and talk about energy. Energy can't be made. You can't just create energy out of nothing. And energy can't be destroyed. You, you can't just ping it away. But energy can be shifted around. It can be stored. So just gently pull your elastic band now with your fingers. Are you okay with the idea that you have given the elastic band energy? The elastic band has got energy now, okay? It's moved. So it's, it's clearly got energy from somewhere. Where has the elastic band's energy come from? The elastic band has got energy, okay? It's moved. Where has that energy come from? I've just told you that you can't just make energy out of nothing. Actually, tell me. Go on, answer. Go on, answer. Say it out loud. It's good for your brain. It's good. It'll fuse brain cells. So a lot of people on Facebook, when I did this lesson live with comments yesterday, uh, were saying it comes from you. Yeah. Can you be a bit more specific, though? It does, it does come from you. What does that actually mean? Where has your energy come from? Yes, your food. So what actually happens is you eat food, that food gets digested, which means broken down into teeny tiny little bits and kind of stored in like nearly all the cells in your body. And then when you breathe in oxygen, a chemical reaction happens. The oxygen reacts with the tiny particles of food in your body, very basically, and releases energy. So 
when you're pulling the elastic band, that's what you're doing. You're you're burning food in your body to and um, to get energy and you're passing that energy along to the elastic band. Okay, much harder question. If you ping the elastic band, don't hurt yourselves, don't hurt yourselves. I kind of like doing it. If you ping the elastic band, where does the energy go then? Like I've just let go. The elastic band has stopped moving. So where's the energy gone? We've gone, the elastic band was storing energy. A lot of you were talking about elastic potential energy. Yeah, last, yeah, last lesson. When you, store elastic potential energy that just means like you've stretched the band okay it's got the potential to move it can move and when you let go it does move but then it stops where's the energy gone that is much harder some people saying uh, into my finger yeah that is kind of true actually like basically energy is just particles moving around so the elastic band has made the particles in your finger kind of move around more if you've heard a twang then some of the energy has moved the air particles around into like a sound wave in your ear. Um, and it seems weird, but actually, like if you drop an elastic band on the table, even though it's a tiny little thing, some energy from the elastic band goes into heating up the table. It makes the particles of the table like move more. And we say that the table has been heated up. Yeah, true. So <clears throat> uh, following on from that then, that has set the scene for this little puzzle for you. I've got a picture of a cow here. And some piles of what we would call sweet corn. I'm going to call it maize. Um, a cow eats three piles of maize. Each pile of maize has a mass. That just means like how much stuff a thing is made of. It's got a mass of 10 kilograms. So one pile of maize, 10 kilograms, two more piles of 10 kilograms. A cow eats three piles. At the end of the day, how many kilograms of maize are stored in the cow? <laughs> a cow eats three piles of 10 kilograms of maize. At the end of the day, how many kilograms of maize are stored in the cow? Is it three kilograms, six kilograms, 30 kilograms, or 600 kilograms? Five, four, three, two. Okay, I was hoping that a lot of you were going to say, well, it's just 10 times three in it, so 30 kilograms. But it's not, actually. No, it's not. It's, uh, it's actually, ah, it's uh, more like six kilograms. So where is, where is the mass gone? Where has it disappeared to? That's what we're going to talk about now. Um, first of all, I need to tell you what actually is biomass, because that's the topic of this lesson. It, it's basically just any living material, all material that has been living. So like dead leaves are biomass, a, a log that's been chopped down, uh, chopped, that would be biomass. But once that log sort of decays into the soil completely, that is not biomass. So you are biomass. You're just a lump of living material. It's the amount of living stuff in a thing. Um, I should say, it's kind of gross. It's it doesn't include water. So, um, so like to get the biomass of a human, you couldn't just weigh the human because obviously humans have got a lot of water in them to find the biomass of a living thing. You kind of have to kill the living thing and just dry it out until you've got the living thing minus all the water in its, in its body and then, and then weigh that. So, so scientists have, have done that. Now we're getting quite good at um, estimating biomass so we don't have to do that so much. Okay, so where's the biomass gone? This cow just ate 30 kilograms of maize, but now only six kilograms is stored in the cow. Where has it gone? Well, quick reminder on some words that we did last week. Um, the maize is the producer. That means it is the maize that is making food using the energy from the sun. So if we were doing the elastic band activity and you said that the energy in the elastic band came from the sun, you were kind of right because plants get carbon dioxide particles that are just in the air, they get water particles from the ground and using energy from the sun, they stick them together and make sugars and then we eat the sugars and then we do stuff with elastic bands and pass that energy on again. So that's the producer, it's the thing that makes the food. And the cow is the consumer, right? Because it eats the producer. If you came last week, can you think of a slightly better, better word for this? It is the consumer, but it's, it's the one that's eating the producer. So it's the, it's the primary consumer. Well done if you got that. Um, where and this is what happens indeed biomass disappears between levels in a food chain um so if you said that the cow would have been storing three kilograms well done in nature it's generally only about 10 percent of the biomass uh from one sort of level of the food chain that that goes into the next level of the food chain up and up and up um but in farming we're, it's a little bit more efficient because obviously the whole point of farming is to get people energy so it would be about about six kilograms okay so if you've got the sheet for my facebook group you can do this on the sheet if not you can do it on the screen why isn't 100 percent of the maize's biomass stored in the cow 
<laughs> I've got a cow here, which I have doctors heavily to give you some clues. Can you label the cow to show where has this lost biomass gone? We had a load of living stuff that has just disappeared. Where's it gone? Um, so you've got a cow with a big stinky pile of poo next to it, uh, and it's doing a wee, and it's breathing out some sort of horrible yellow gas. Uh, it's got bits of leaf falling from its gob, and it's <laughs> it's got some water coming from its armpit. That's supposed to be sweat. I don't know. If, I don't know enough about cows to know if that's a thing. <laughs> But I'll give you 15 seconds. If you haven't got the sheet from Facebook, you're lucky because you get to sketch a cow and then uh, label it. I want you to use your own language, first of all. And then I'll put some words up on the board and you can use that to help you finish off. Drawing a picture of a poo on the board for reasons which I will explain in a minute. You done some of that? Okay, I'll put some of my answers on the board, but they'll be in a weird mixed up order and you can put them where you think. So, urea is one of the words. What is urea? Hmm? Uh, I've written not eaten, cow's body burns it for energy, sweat, not digested, breathing out carbon dioxide. And then I'll put, if you're done, do you want to have a guess which one of these things are ingestion, which ones are excretion, and which ones are respiration? That's really hard. I've said guess because I don't think you're going to know, but you might be interested to have a guess. OK, I'll give you another um, 20 seconds to use some of those words to alter your diagram, if you like. And then we'll carry on. Okay, here we go then. Hopefully this wasn't too bad. So, not digested, uh, those two words I've put near the poo, okay? It's subtle, isn't it? But there is a difference between something not being eaten and not being digested. So the poo is the food that wasn't digested. Not being eaten is just any little scraps that are on the floor. Maybe one of them was a bit rotten or <clears throat> was a bit too hard. Um, sweat, yeah. Breathing out carbon dioxide. A lot of you on Facebook were talking about cow burps and methane. Yes, very good. I haven't gone into that today. Um, the cow's body burns it for energy. And urea is, is what's in the we. <laughs> so um, urine obviously contains a lot of water. But biomass, remember, we're not talking about water. We don't include water. So urea, you know how like you get a glass of water, you add some concentrated orange juice and it becomes orange juice. Urea is like the thing that you put in water to make it into urine, make it so sort of stinky and green. So urea is the sort of solid particles that have come from your food or the cow's food. I've written feces on the board here because this is the, if you're just shouting poo at the screen and have been for minutes now, can you start shouting feces instead? We will call poo feces for it is the proper word for food that has not been digested. And yeah, which ones are ingestion? Which ones are excretion? And which ones are respiration? You probably didn't know that and I'll tell you now. I, I'm quite surprised by this. Um, I think you were going to think that excretion was feces, like excrement is like poo, but no, ingestion is poo. So you might have heard the word ingest. If you ingest food, it just means you put it into your face. Uh, if you digest food, you break food apart. And egest means food coming out. So any food that isn't digested gets egested. I know. Uh, yeah, I don't know how we're going to remember that. There you go. Digest. If it's not digested, it's ingested. And excrement is actually um, the waste that comes out of a body because you're using your food to burn energy. So it, it, you're not poo is it, sorry feces. Feces is food that hasn't been used. Right. If you do use food to burn energy, then you excrete other waste products. Like urea comes out because it's a byproduct of you burning energy, burning food. Uh, sweat as well and breathing out carbon dioxide as well that's all that's all stuff that your body gives off in order to get energy from your food and respiration means using food to release energy this is all GCSE stuff so don't worry if you're not quite following it you'd have to remember it probably not doing your GCSEs anytime very soon um 
but just out of interest. So ingestion, I put a little square. Ingestion is the poo because it's not digested. It's ingested. Mm -hmm. uh, and the triangles, no, the circles, the things that you excrete because you are burning food it, to get energy is breathing out carbon dioxide and urea and sweat. Uh, and respiration is, yeah, like when your body burns for energy. So carbon dioxide is one of the things that is breathed out because you are respiring. Whew. Right, let's do something, shall we, with our hands. Um, I said to bring a piece of paper. If you've got a piece of paper, can you fold it in half? I'm trying to remember how many times. Fold it in half once. Fold it in half twice. You, if you could do it on a table or something, it'd be neat, great. Or you could just do it like me. I'm trying to show you what I'm doing. Fold it in half once, twice, three times. I'm going to do it on the table. I can't. Uh, four times, right, five times altogether. You need to fold this piece of paper in half five times. So I fold it in half four times. It's really gross. Because what we need is lots of creases. So we're going to open it out again and have lots of little rectangles on a piece of paper. To so fold it in half five times. I can't lie to you, because you might need to do this too. I gotta fold it in half and then give it a little chew. <laughs> I don't know the grossest thing I've ever done. Oh, and maybe not quite on this show. Okay, little chew, don't get it soggy. But if you've, if you've managed to fold a piece of paper in, in half five times, then when you open it out, you should have eight rectangles across and four rectangles up. This is our squared paper. It's accessible, okay? You don't all have squared paper and you don't all have printers. So we're gonna all do this together. We're gonna to pretend that this is squared paper and we're gonna talk about pyramids of biomass. Here is a very simple picture of one. A pyramid of biomass. This is a classic thing that you learn at school. Uh, you've got different layers. These um, show the amount of biomass at each level of the food chain. So this is a super simple one. We've got grass on the bottom, caterpillars in the middle and then sparrows above so you can see right as you would expect we've got more biomass more particles of stuff on the bottom um and then the caterpillars eat the grass but as we've seen a lot of the particles of grass go on different things like the caterpillars do poos and breathe out particles of grass and sweat or whatever i don't know <laughs> so there's less biomass on that next layer uh, these layers by the way, are called trophic layers, to be proper about it. So grass would be the first trophic layer, caterpillars is the second trophic layer, and sparrows are the third trophic layer. Um, and, oops, yeah, the lowest trophic layer in a pyramid of biomass is always the biggest, for reasons which we have explained. So um, this is why you very rarely get more than four or five trophic layers in a food chain or in a pyramid of biomass because uh, obviously each layer, the living things are doing lots of pooing, sorry, feces-ing and excreting and urea's coming out of them. Um, so by the time you get to the, the top of the pyramid of biomass, there's not that much energy left for everyone else. Incidentally, I only just learned this. Did you know, I've never heard this before, but apparently the very tip of the triangle, of like any triangle, is called the apex heard the word apex before when people are talking about food chains yeah the apex predator yeah the apex predator is the the big top predator of the food chain that eats eats animals below it and doesn't get eaten by anything so the apex predator is at the apex of the pyramid of biomass i know like language and maths and science all coming together so <clears throat> we are going to draw a pyramid of biomass let me show you how you do that here we go so this is uh, squared paper. Let's say we want to draw a pyramid of biomass. Well, first of all, all the layers have got to be the same height. So ours is, because we're using squared paper. Um, keep the heights the same is rule number one. Then you've got to have the same amount on each side. So don't, don't like squidge all your columns up to one side to line them up next to each other, okay? They've got to be piled exactly on top of each other in the middle. Um, and the number of squares across has got to be to scale with the amount of biomass. So here, I've just done it really simply here. I've said, um, if I want to show 30 kilograms of maize, I'll just color in 30 squares across. And then uh, I want to show six kilograms of cow, so I've done six squares across, and then humans, I don't know, I sort of gave up after that. <laughs> uh, but obviously it doesn't have to be the same amount of squares, it can be to scale, okay? So if I wanted to show 30 kilograms of maize, but I've only got this many squares, 
then I might say, okay, I'll say one square equals three kilograms. So three kilograms is one square, six, 12, 18, 24, 30, etc., etc., etc. So if I colour in 10 squares, that represents 30 kilograms. But I just have to make sure that I wrote my key so that anyone reading this knew that. And then I've coloured in two squares for the cows. So that was to show six kilograms, yeah? And then humans, that is, I think that's half a square. So what would that be in kilograms? It would be half a square. Um, well, one square is three kilograms, so that's one and a half kilograms of human biomass Ugh, at the top there. Okay, you can also get pyramids of number. These are kind of thought of as the easier ones because you just put the number of each thing on each level. So if you had 12 pieces of maize, you colour in 12 squares or whatever it could be to scale again. If you got three cows, colour in three squares and then one human would be one square. Okay, right. Come back up here for a sec. So I'm going to show you the question sheet now. This is causing a lot of confusion uh, and delay on, on Facebook. I ha I'm just showing you a picture of a very simple food chain. If you've seen the film Finding Dory, I won't do any spoilers because it's just the best film ever, but she finds herself in a forest of kelp. Kelp is very, very big, almost tree-like pieces of seaweed, okay? So kelp forests are under the ocean and uh, eating some of the kelp are sea urchins. Sea urchins look a bit like this. Okay, I'm telling you this because Facebook has taught me that otherwise this bit is quite confusing. This is a sea urchin. Okay, it's a, a picture of one. Um, sea urchins eat the kelp and the sea urchins get eaten by sea otters. Yeah, finding Dory. She meets some adorable little sea otters and they help us over the day. Um, so I just want you to look at this picture. And first of all, tell me how many pieces of kelp you can see, how many sea urchins you can see, and how many otters you can see. I don't know why people on Facebook were making such a fuss about this. It's very obvious how many pieces of kelp and sea urchin there are. Um, count them. Do me a pyramid of number, first of all. So just like how many pieces of kelp and use your squared paper, just colour in how many squares the kelp are and then how many sea urchins there are above that and then how many otters above that okay and that'll be our pyramid of number so show the food chain but just the numbers and then on the other side you can have to do a little bit of maths to work out the total mass of the kelp and color in a row for that and the total mass of the sea urchins and the total mass of the otter all right so that's quite a long warm-up but i want to make sure that no because there's no comments so you can't tell me if you're horribly confused okay Thank you, Chris Taig, for taking a picture of kelp that I could horribly Photoshop for my needs. <clears throat> Here we go. It's not that hard, right? How many pieces of kelp can you see? How many sea urchins can you see? And how many otters can you see? Isn't, there's no tricks here. That is not part of the fun that I've hidden things secretly. No. Just count them. <laughs> and then draw a pyramid of number for them on your shoddy little piece of square paper. <laughs> and then draw a pyramid of biomass on the other side. And if you've done that, can you please tell me uh, what's the difference? <clears throat> Which one do you think is better and why? I'm going to do it with you so that I know that I'm going up about the right pace. OK, so pyramid of number. Well, that's, it might look a bit weird, your pyramid of number. That's totally fine. That's kind of my point, actually. If you're really confused, I'll, I'll tell you how many, right, you should have got that there are four kelp, okay? One, two, three, four. And there are eight sea urchins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. And there's one otter, <laughs> one adorable little sea otter. There we go. Who apparently, like, use the kelp, cling to the, use the, use the kelp, sort of attach their babies to, so the babies don't float away, someone told me in the comments. Right, uh, I've drawn my pyramid of number.
If you're working really fast uh, and you're on question four already, I'm not. I'm still drawing my period of mid of biomass. If you're on question four, um, it's not a really obvious, obvious answer for that. You could write down a few different things, and I have given you some clues. So get your brain exercising for that one. Oh my goodness, how incredibly tedious of me. You must have been screaming at me, uh, that, but I couldn't hear you. I didn't put the masses on. Oh, oh, foolish mistake to make. Uh, yeah, sorry, of course you can't draw a pyramid of biomass. You haven't got the masses. Um, one piece of dry kelp weighs 20 kilograms. One dried sea urchin weighs 2.5 kilograms. And one dry otter, this isn't a very nice thought, is it? Weighs uh, 10 kilograms. Ugh, sorry, I just got to my pyramid of biomass and realised that I'd made that mistake. So, OK, you've got four pieces of kelp and each piece of kelp weighs 20 kilograms. So if each piece of kelp weighs 20 kilograms and you've got four pieces of kelp, how much kelp have you got all together? And we're going to have to draw a, write a key, aren't we? Um, OK. So I'll show you the pyramid of number very quickly so that you know you're on the right track. Um, so the pyramid of number, well, in an ideal world, would look uh, like this, okay? So there's four pieces of kelp, so you should have four rectangles coloured in on the bottom. There's eight sea urchins, so you should have eight in the middle. And there's only one otter, so you should have like half a square on either side of the middle line, okay? So that's your pyramid of number. Uh, I'll just send you back for like sort of 15 more seconds so that you can finish off your biomass because I didn't put my numbers on the screen, sorry. OK, let's see how you did. It doesn't matter if you haven't finished, because you can always um, copy mine once you've had a look at mine. <laughs> you might not want to copy mine. Um, here's a pyramid of number nicely on the screen. And here's a pyramid of biomass nicely on the screen. So you should have had 80 kilograms on the bottom, because it's 20 kilograms of kelp, but there's four pieces of kelp, so that's 80 altogether. Um, and then 20 kilograms of sea urchins, because it was two and a half kilograms of sea urchin, but there were eight of them. Uh, and then one 10 kilogram otter on the top. So <laughs> this, this is what mine looked like in real life. Uh, that's my pyramid of number, which as you will notice, is not a pyramid, is it? This is one of the main problems with pyramids of number, um, is that they really don't show you how much biomass is at each level at all. Um, so the, the classic example is a, like obviously with the grass one, it would have done because you would have had loads of blades of grass and then not so many cows and then not so many humans. But the classic example is like an oak tree. So you get one oak tree. So it would just be a one at the bottom. But a one oak tree obviously supports loads and loads of different insects, which supports a few birds. Um, 
But, so the pyramid of biomass is generally thought of to be better because it very clearly shows how much biomass at each level. The problem with the pyramid of biomass, like I say, is that really, in order to do it very accurately, you have to kill the things you're trying to study and dry them out, which is obviously not very pleasant um, <laughs> and, and quite difficult to do in some cases. So, uh, yeah. You don't, you, you don't see them that often. Um, I've had to draw a key, see, one square is 10 kilograms. So we had 80 kilograms of kelp, so eight squares, two, 20 kilograms of urchin, so that's two squares, and then one otter on the top, all right? Um, I had a look to see if I could find an actual pyramid of biomass in a study, and the one that I found was one where they'd studied sharks and found a pyramid of biomass uh, in this area with sharks was inverted. It was such a big deal. It made the news, I will show you. Here we are. Extreme inverted trophic pyramid of reef sharks. Look at that. So hopefully you've got an idea of what trophic means now. Um, so yeah, this particular pass in this certain area, they noticed that there were just loads more sharks than there sort of should have been. So here's a beautiful diagram we can see of some biomass pyramids doing exactly the opposite of what I've told you they always do. The, the uh, producer layer, the first trophic layer, I should say, is the smallest and a load of sharks. What's going on here? Like I say, it was, it was such a big deal. Made the BBC news. How a huge school of sharks flips the food pyramid. Wow. So it turns out uh, what was happening was the, the average biomass for the year in this area was far too small. There were 700 sharks sometimes living in this, this certain place, um, this sort of pass. And there was nowhere near enough biomass underneath them to support them. But what it was, was every year uh, in winter, loads of fish swim into this pass and the shark eat them and get fanned up and then the fish go again. So, that, so that's what was happening. But yeah, like overall on average, just like, wow, a pyramid of biomass made the news. I was not expecting that. Um, so that is the end of the lesson, except obviously got your GCSE questions because everyone wants to know how they're going to do in their GCSE. This is only for fun, okay? Right? It doesn't matter if you get them all wrong or if you can't do them. But I thought it might be interesting for you to see how uh, GCSE science sounds quite scary. It's actually really not a very big a jump at all between what we've just covered today and GCSE science. Um, I better do my ad <laughs> before I show you these. This is my job. Ah, such a good job. So the reason that this can be my job is I just do everything for free. So all the lessons are for free. Everything's available to watch afterwards on, on catch up, like literally everything that I've ever done. Um, and the printouts are free in my Facebook group as well. Um, and for the IGCC physics lessons, if you want to come to those, I even do like little links in my Facebook group to uh, homeworks, past paper questions that I found that I think you should be able to answer. So yeah, everything's free, but if you sign up to support me with five or six quid a month, I send you nice things to say thank you so much. It works out pretty good value if you like use me a lot, because obviously, you know, you can't usually get a lesson for four lessons for five pounds. Uh, I will send you rainbow glasses to make you see rainbows, they're amazing, and I'll send you a couple of pages that I wrote to explain how they work, and I'll send you Theory of Science magazine. It's a very good time to sign up, because if you sign up now, you get a past magazine, because I always send that, um, but you also get the latest magazine when it comes out, and it's coming out in the next couple of weeks. It's at the printers right now, it's about sleep. Um, so if you want a past magazine, which comes with a free biodegradable plastic bag so that you can grow mold. It's all about mold. And then the sleep magazine in like within a fortnight. Sign up, search online for theatre science and then coffee and it'll take you to this website. Okay, cool. GCC question time. And then I'll go to my Facebook page and see if any of you have said hello. Here we are. So, <laughs> some of these are quite tricky actually, I must say. Um, we've got part of a food chain here. We've got a frog, which has been eaten by a snake, which has been eaten by a fox. So my questions are, can you sketch a pyramid of biomass for this food chain? So some people on Facebook were getting concerned and saying, but I don't know the numbers. It doesn't matter this time. It's just a sketch. So just give the, well, you've got to give the general shape and you've got to label it for two marks at GCSE. Sketch a pyramid of biomass for a frog, being eaten by a snake, being eaten by a fox. And can you give two reasons why the biomass of the snake is less than the biomass of the frog. I haven't worded that very well, have I? Because obviously frogs do weigh less than snakes, but like in the, the period
Sorry, someone's trying to call me, uh, but I was looking at the snow outside, so if it froze then, I apologise. <laughs> yeah, question two is, why doesn't the whole mass of the frog end up being stored in the snake? And question three, which of the following is not excreted from the human body? Which of these is not, technically speaking, excreted from the human body? Is it A, sweat, B, faeces, or C, urea? Right, should we go through the answers? So your sketched pyramid of biogas, bi biogas biomass, uh, just looked like this. This is two marks of GCSE, how nice is that? If you've got the lowest trophic level is the biggest, then give yourself one mark. So if, it's, if it goes big and then smaller and then smallest at the top, that's one mark. And if you've labelled it correctly, give yourself another mark. So if you if you put like fox on the bottom and frog on the top, you'd only got one mark. But if it's frog on the bottom, snake in the middle and fox on the top, then that's another mark. Well done, two marks. GCC biology, that's right, isn't it? Uh, this next one, why is not the whole frog stored in the snake? Well, you could have said some bits not digested, like you, they could call that egestion. So um, if it, the snake ate the frog, but then it couldn't digest the bones, it might have pooed them out, that would be egestion. Um, some bits of the, so weird, some bits of the frog would be like breathed out as carbon dioxide, so that's respiration, um, is where some of the biomass goes. You could have said excretion, so like, do snakes sweat? But you know, excretion is any kind of um, like urea or uh, sweat or breathing, any of those things. Uh, and you could have said respiration as well, but interesting to note, you wouldn't have been allowed to say respiration makes energy because energy cannot be made, can it? It can only be shifted around. Uh, and finally, which of these is not excreted? It's faeces, bizarrely. The excrement is not, does not technically count as excretion um, because it's, it's not a consequence of you burning uh, food for energy, whereas sweat and urea are. Oof. All right, you lot, I'll hang on that for a couple of seconds just so that anyone who wants you can get the answers. And then I will go to my Facebook page and see who has said hello to me. And then I'm going to take a little break and then I'm coming back at 2 p.m. to this YouTube channel again because I'm doing a show. This is just like a kind of informal chat about snow. So we're going to do an activity to do with snow. If you bring some ice cubes and a glass of water and some string and some salt, we'll do a very cool snow activity. We'll hear an excellent Lego story time about Yeti. Um, yeah, it's going to be good. So that's at two o'clock. Right, come back here. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go, have my lunch, and then come back here to tell you a story about Yeti if you want to come and watch that. Um, or I'll see you here next week for another ecosystems lesson. I think, I can't remember, I think we're doing, um, I think we're doing competition next week. We've got competition coming up, like how animals compete for food, and we've got adaptions coming up, how animals are adapted to their environment. Um, and we've got like how you measure animals as well. So how you, not like the height of them, but how you know when animals are going extinct, that sort of thing. Yeah, and then it's these holidays. Then we're gonna do waves. All right, let's see if anyone's left me any messages. Wow, there's loads. Uh-oh. Sometimes if I've got loads of comments, yeah, I think a lot of these comments are gonna be, we haven't got the masses. <laughs> what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense. You haven't given us the masses. Let's see how many comments are like that. Oh, the first one's nice. It's just Suki and Arthur and Eunice and Sala saying hello. Hello. Hello, Sala and Eunice and Arthur and Suki. Oh, look, Anna, Arthur and Abra are watching and saying hello as well. Okay, this is good. You're not angry with me yet. This is uh, 37 minutes ago. Lucy joins. Hello. <laughs> Pip saying, it isn't eating all of it. Nice. And it isn't using all of it. Excellent. Hello, Pip and Ivan. Hello. Oh, and there's Susanna. Oh, everyone's just been like super friendly and no one's shouting at me at all in the comments. It's a Bella. Hello. Bella, I love it when you send me photos. And there's Susanna, all right. That's Susanna, yes. What are you saying? Oh, the pyramid of biomass with the kilograms on is much better. It's accurate and makes sense because the largest biomass, which is also the producer, that's a nice detail, can go on the bottom. Brilliant. New Cardi, yeah. 
Yeah. I don't I, yeah. Oh, that with a card, it's just crumpled up on the floor. That's why it's good that I get everything from charity shops. It'll be okay in real life, I just think. It's too much shades of green. Hello, Dax and Mum Charlotte. Oh, look! No! Oh, guys, can I, I don't think Robin will mind if I show you this photo, because it's public anyway. So Robin comes on YouTube every, uh, every week to watch. But last week, he didn't come because he went to the Manchester Museum, which is one of my favorite places. I went to Manchester University and saw a Tygon. Oh, this is so cool. So we've done the very first of these ecosystem lessons. We did about loads of different words and looked at what is a species. And we were looking at how a lion and a tiger having a baby. It's called a Tygon and there's one actually here. Ah. Robin, you legend, look at that. So that is a stuffed Tygon in the Manchester Museum. Epic. Um, if you're thinking, oh, it's really sad and cruel that it's stuffed. It's actually quite good because we learned that um, they have terrible health problems, do tigers, and you shouldn't really keep them alive. I mean, don't kill them all, but like, don't breed them. <laughs> so, so it's good that we've got one to look at, but we don't have to breed them. Maud the Tygon. Meet, he's sent me the label on it as well. Meet Maud, one of the most extraordinary cats Manchester has ever seen. Her father was a tiger and her mother was a lion and she lived in Manchester Zoo. What? From 1936 until 1949. Oh, it's not very long, is it? When she died, her skin was preserved. Brilliant. A local taxidermist mounted her skin to a lifelike pose. Oh, in 2015? What? So Manchester Museum just had this tiger skin from 1949 and then finally in 2016 someone was like i can make that into a tiger if you like brilliant hello tom wow what a wealth of uh, wonderful hellos and comments and information in the uh, in the comments and not a single person shouting at me for delaying the masses well that's made, left me feeling great thanks you lot i'm gonna go and get ready for the lego story time show and i'll see you either then or sometime next week have a lovely rest of your week and enjoy the snow if you've got any bye